Well, Shalom Torah fans, uh, Michael is on assignment, but he wanted to give the stage to our guest today anyway. So you have very good timing being here today. If you love Sodom and Gomorrah, the Ark of the Covenant, the Red Sea Crossing, all of these classic teachings Michael does, Michael has something very uh, familiar with our guest today. They both ran into a, a man named Ron Wyatt many years ago, and today's guest is the uh, president of Ark Discovery International. Please welcome Kevin Fisher. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Nice to be with you, Scott. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live. So, this is something that I know was very close to Michael's heart, and he wishes he could be here, so he sends his regards, and uh, he wanted to just to tell everyone uh, watching Shabbat Night Live that uh, that he wanted to be here and, and ask you these questions, but I get the privilege of doing so. Fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah. So, Ron Wyatt, way back in, gosh, the 70s, Ron was looking into the mysteries of the Bible, as we now find commonplace on places like uh, the History Channel and Discovery, sure. and he was really the pioneer in all of these things. Um, how did it start for him? Okay. Well, he had seen a 1960 Life magazine article about this boat-shaped formation in the mountains of Ararat uh, there in eastern Turkey. It was spotted by a Turkish army captain, uh, Mr. Dur Pinar, okay. and in 1959. And so this group, mainly from the USA, went out there to explore the site and Life Magazine reported on their uh, time out there. They saw the boat-shaped formation. Half of them thought it was a natural formation. The other half thought, hey, this has got potential. But it sat there you know, for 17 years without anyone else going out there. And so Ron Wyatt started thinking about going out there and investigating the site. But before he went anywhere or did anything, he had a burden for souls. And he prayed to the Lord, Lord, help me find something that will help someone get to heaven. This wasn't about, Lord, help me find something so I can get rich. It was about doing the Lord's work and helping someone get to heaven. And that's the way uh, everyone describes uh, Ron Wyatt. That's right. Uh, now, he, Ron Wyatt, if for those of our audience who don't know, he was an amateur archaeologist. He was not a professional archaeologist who worked for some big uh, organization or anything like that. That's right. And the disciples were not professional theologians Good either. Point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So God will use the humble to confuse the wise. And so God chose him. Ron went out there in 77. Uh, and he didn't know exactly where to look for this boat-shaped formation. He had three days in the area, because it's a five-and-a-half-day trip out there, and then five-and-a-half days back, using his two-week vacation from work. <laughs> so, like most of us understand. And so, he and his sons knelt down and prayed, Lord, help us find this. They had rented a taxi to drive them around. Now this was in 77. 77. So, so no one else from the Western world had been out to this area. This is, uh, first of all, where are we talking about here? This is in Eastern Turkey next to the border with Iran. Okay, so yeah. I'm assuming that, uh, that the folks in that area, that it's, it's a local, local legend if nothing else, they yeah. knew about this thing. The villagers there, there's a village right near the site. You know, they believed that that was uh, Noah's Ark. But of course, the word hasn't gotten out you know, properly or people don't believe. So they prayed that God would uh, stall their taxi where they needed to look. They actually prayed they for... They prayed for, you know, divine <laughs> intervention. Okay. And so the taxi starts driving around, and all of a sudden, the taxi stopped, quit running. The driver's confused, but Ron and his sons are excited. Huh. And they jump out and put a pile of stones there. Okay. And they get back in, the car starts up and they start driving again. So this happened two more times that day. So this thing, now did they pray for, I mean, maybe you don't even know this end of it, did, did they pray for that the taxi would stall well, something specific they were in or the something would happen? Well, they were in the taxi and they prayed that God would intervene and help them okay. find it. Okay. Okay, so anyway, the taxi stalled three times and so the next day they went back to these piles of stones and they walked directly out from them and there is Noah's Ark. They are the sea anchors that hung from the ark to help keep the front pointed into the waves. And then the remains of what appears to be Noah's house or some building associated with Noah. So God directed them to these sites. And these are things that Ron you know, later investigated. And of course the Noah's Ark site was uh, deemed Noah's Ark National Park with a visitor center. And wow. uh, 
Well, so, we'll get into that. We want yeah. to save some of these details. We yes. want to give away all yeah, the... Yeah, so uh, God was using him. Yeah. Okay, and mm -hmm. God could tell, you know, God, Ron could tell God was using him, and the next year, then, he decides to start looking for the Red Sea Crossing site. Now, what possessed him to do this type of thing? Is it just a divine... I think God puts God ideas in people's minds. Absolutely, If you're in yes. connection with God, he puts thoughts in your mind. So he got the idea the next year, you know, to look for the Red Sea Crossing site. Mm -hmm. And so he went to uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, to the northern end of Gulf of Aqaba, Zalat, mm -hmm. and they rented an airplane to look along the eastern edge of the Sinai Peninsula for an opening through the mountains. So now this is, way, now nowadays we have movies like Patterns of Evidence, uh, you know, a, yes. a modern uh, documentary that was just done, uh, and, and all these other, you know, like we said, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, but this is in what, 1980? Well, 78, yes. 78, so yeah. this is before any Westerner had dared stick their neck out and look for these things. Yeah, this is a totally new area. No, no one had looked over the Gulf of Aqaba off the Red Sea Crossing, for instance. So uh, he hired an airplane and asked the pilot, Moses, Moses. Moses. Yes, Moses. Now, <laughs> I love it. He said, Moses, is there a way for the children of Israel to go to these mountains here along the eastern edge of the Sinai Peninsula? And Moses said, yes, I know the spot. <laughs> I'll bet Moses knows the spot. Yeah, he sure does. <laughs> and so they went down to the beach at Nueva, a Nueva, large yes. yeah, five-mile long beach uh, that juts out three miles into the Gulf. And he said, there's Wadi Watur that goes through the mountains and empties onto this beach. It's about a 30-mile drive through the mountains. We've been through there. Now, the Wadi Watur, the, a wadi essentially is a dry, deep cavern. Like a canyon, a yeah. Canyon. Yeah, yeah, and they, they snake their way there to the Red Sea Crossing site. So, and while he was there, he found this column marking the spot. A column? Like what, what kind of it column? A, it was a pillar erected by Solomon, he found out later. Okay. Okay, and then the next time they went there, they found chariot wheels in the water. So on that second trip they made there, with the first dive, they found the chariot wheels. Uh, he had to, to leave. He was going back to Jerusalem to fly out. And it's at that point then that um, God performed a miracle. He raised Ron's arm in the garden tomb grounds, and Ron said, there's Jeremiah's grotto, and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. So wait, wait a second. Yeah, so this so, is... He's le being led from one adventure to another. Exactly. This is like real life Indiana exactly. Jones here. Right. And so you know, he, he conducted the dig later and did find the Ark of the Covenant. But let's take a look at this. From 77 to 78, he found out the location of Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. He found the Red Sea Crossing spot. That then told him for sure Mount Sinai is over in Saudi Arabia. And God raised his arm and put the words out of his mouth, there's Jeremiah's grotto, and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. He said that in 78. Within one year, he had found, through the Lord's leading, these four incredible discoveries. God was truly using him. That is unreal. So yes. obviously, now, for, because people have been searching for these things from, you know, for centuries, sure. for thousands of years. You yeah. know, there, there's always the legend of the, uh, uh, the, the chalice that, that Christ used at the Last Supper, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, sure. all of these type of things. You know, where's a piece of the cross? Everybody's always looking for relics, yes. but Ron was not looking for relics for relics' sake, was he? No, he was wanting to do the Lord's work, and the Lord had a plan for these things to come out. These discoveries, they all deal with judgment in the past, okay? At the flood, God judged man, had to destroy the wicked, but he saved his faithful. Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he judged the wicked, destroyed them. He saved his people. Hmm. The Red Sea Crossing, he saved his people, destroyed the wicked. Mount Sinai, he handed down the law, spoke it, and wrote it. And then, of course, the Ark of the Covenant contains that same law that we'll be judged by. So these are signs of past judgments. Why does he want them to come out? It's because the judgment of the living is coming soon, hmm. where we'll receive either the seal of God or the mark of the beast. So God has a plan. These are all going to be shown to mankind before God judges everyone. And on the opposite side of that judgment is obviously deliverance, which also happened in yes. each one of those right, right. stories. Right, right. He saved his people through these judgments. You know, it's no wonder that people look at Ron Wyatt's discoveries and say, 
well, how could one man find all of these in a span yeah. of uh, a year or so? Right, and it's, it's sad to even hear Christians saying that. You know, there's a lot of people out there that think God is no longer involved in miracles. That's a thing of the past. He's not doing major miracles anymore. But in this case, you see miracle after miracle where God used Ron and, and, and assisted him. And uh, so it, it's very exciting. So now you had run into Ron. Now Ron did, did this in 1978, 79. Uh, and he also ventured into uh, Arabia and was arrested. We'll, we'll get into all that later. Yeah. But uh, you ran into him in about, uh, what was it, 1984? 1984. Okay. He had been released from the Saudi Arabian prison where he and his sons had crossed over by foot to and go they were, to Mount Sinai. Right. Now, they were looking for Mount Sinai in Arabia and basically got caught. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And they accused him of uh, espionage, being, being right? Being an Israeli spy, yeah. which is totally false, you know. But uh, so he had been released from prison. He's been in prison 76 days. And of course, he made the national news and he had a presentation at a church in Nashville, Tennessee. And that's where I met him. I really felt impressed. These things were real. And so I started following his work for years, um, reading his newsletters, going to presentations, calling him on the phone. Uh, but you know, but sadly in 99, he passed away. But the discoveries, since they're real, they continue on. And people are learning more and more that they really are authentic. So when you first met him in, in 84, did you have a chance to talk to him? Did you have any idea that you wanted to promote his work at that point? Or were you just sort of a curious onlooker and, and just a participant in his talks? Well, that was my first taste of it. But I really felt impressed that they were real. And I did talk to him a little bit. but. Um, just kept following it, kept going to presentations, and the more I got into it, the more I saw that this is real. You know, this isn't something made up. Hmm. And when something's as exciting as big as this, you know God is involved, and, and that's been the case. Indeed. So when you met, so you met him in '84, and then uh, did you work? You worked, or you got his newsletter and everything. Uh, before, until he died. Did you ever work with him before he passed away? No, not directly, hmm. no. But I did, you know, I did, like I say, call him on the phone, ask him questions, talk to other direct supporters, you know, see what was going on and so forth. But after he died, in, in 2000, I started my website, arcdiscovery.com, and so I started uh, you know, promoting the discoveries and then going over to the sites. And one thing after another, it was just as he said, you know, I found man-made metal on Noah's Ark, finding the brimstone in Sodom and Gomorrah and cremated bone. Um, mm. So, you know, these things, these things are real. Now you had, uh, in 84, you, you went to see him. And as you mentioned now, it's, it's just led to a, uh, a lifelong passion and it yeah. has led to some, uh, well, you said you're retired now and you do arcdiscovery.com as a, uh, more than a, you don't want to call it a hobby. It's a, it's a part-time job. Where it's you a are, passion, yes. It's a passion, yeah, yeah. That's even a better. Yeah. And you got, just like any of us, you've got two grown kids. Yes. And a wife. So, and you're doing all these uh, travel, travelings. So let's go back to way back when this all started. What even possessed you to go see Ron Wyatt in 1984? What was the fascination? Well, you know, I heard about the presentation taking place. And, you know, Noah's Ark, what, you know? Mm -hmm. And, Had you uh, been an archaeology buff as a well, kid? Well, no, or no, it just, you know, got my interest. Okay. And, you know, these are major things. This isn't a little piece of pottery found in some, you know, normal dig someplace. Mm -hmm. These are huge discoveries that threaten the forces of darkness. And we've seen over the years how Satan has tried to discredit Ron, tried to discredit the discoveries. But um, when you're working with God's things, you have to expect uh, these false accusations to come up. So you, so you go to this this presentation in 84. How old are you then? I was 24. 24 years old. So you're yeah. just a young guy yeah, those straight out days. of college. Yeah. Okay, starting yeah. a career and, and you, you hear of this thing. So along the years, did it, did it ever occur to you, well, gosh, maybe I should be helping Ron. Did, did you want to help him before he passed away? Well, it, it took time and money and I didn't have either. So uh, time ran out, you know, when Ron passed away. Mm. It, was, it was sad. But then I started going to the sites. A tour group opened up in 2000, first time going to Noah's Ark in like eight or 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been back there several times since. But 
it's all incredible and it's all real, Scott. Wow, that is yeah. that is just unreal. So now he's doing all these discoveries, but that's not his full-time job. As we mentioned earlier, Ron is not right. an archaeologist. That's right. He was a nurse and ethodist. Hmm. But so he would work a month or two in Nashville, take most of that money and head overseas mm -hmm. to work on these discoveries back and forth, back and forth for 22 years doing this. Wow. And uh, he spent approximately a million dollars working on the discoveries and 120 to 130 trips overseas. If you can imagine going overseas 120, 130 times, that right there wears you out. That is a worn out passport uh, yeah. if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, living out of a suitcase, you know, for half of your life, half of the... Goodness, what did his wife think of all this? Did you ever talk about that? Well, she's been a big supporter and a big help to him. Okay. Yeah. Is she still with us? She is, she yes. Mary Mary now Wyatt Lee. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but Ron totally devoted to this, you know, putting his time in it, putting his money in it. And you know when someone is doing that much and, and, it, and everything he's saying, one thing after another is found to be true. The man's humble, authentic. Um, very genuine Christian. A lot of people can see that when he's doing a presentation, speaking at a church. They can see that you know, he's a he's a genuine, humble Christian man. Hmm. So he's going now. He's a nurse uh, anesthetist. So he's uh, you know he's he's not a he's not living below the poverty line. He has some money to to to, uh, right. to spend, and obviously he did that with his trips. I understand by looking at your website, uh, arcdiscovery.com, that. When Ron was with us, I mean, his home looked very humble. He lived in a, a he chose yeah, to live in a duplex. That's true. I mean, he lived in a duplex, if you can imagine, a humble little duplex uh, with large bookcases, with all these uh, uh, archaeology books, you know, historical books where he would do research and so forth. Um, so he was putting his money where his mouth was and putting it into the work, devoting, you know, his life to this. So you knew that this man was you know telling the truth. The, you can see the four major discoveries, the Noah's Ark, Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are visible things that you can see are real. Now the Ark of the Covenant, some people have had a lot of doubt, but his credibility was established. God showed that he was working with Ron. And when Ron comes out with a report from the Ark of the Covenant cave, we need to respect that. On the Day of Atonement, when a priest went into the Most Holy Place, he didn't take a committee in there with him to anoint the Most Holy. He went in by himself to do the Lord's work and came out with a report. Ron did the same thing. He went into the Most Holy Place, got to see the Ark of the Covenant, and he came out with a report. And so we should respect that. I have respect just for the fact of seeing some of these photos of, I mean, this guy had some guts. When you look at the first photo, I think it was from 19, uh, the photo said around 1981, uh, the first time he went down into the, uh, into the cave where the Ark of the Covenant is, where he found it, mm -hmm. that is a small opening. This was not some yes. giant cave. This yeah. is it's scary. A 100 foot tunnel leading down to the Ark of the Covenant cave and you're going down a chimney, up a chimney, squeezing through tight places, as you say, going, sliding across a board with a 40-foot drop. Um, very precarious, very hard work. He worked from 79 to 82 mm. on this first tunnel that he dug. So he dug this tunnel? Well, he and his associates, there's a lot of people that helped him. Yeah, but Some of it were natural cavities. You would hit a natural cavity that would mm -hmm. let you go a little further. And you may, uh, of course, this is solid rock we're talking about. We're not talking about just loose sand or soil. Right. This is, this is hard work. So he progressed, you know, the 100 feet to get to the spot. But he said this is too difficult a route to get to the Ark of the Covenant cave. And so he spent another uh, seven or eight years building a second tunnel Hmm. to the Ark of the Covenant cave. And we're talking a, a lot of money spent on the second tunnel because he thought some of the temple furnishings needed to come out. So again, building a second tunnel, a friend of mine was on the dig with Ron for about three weeks. He said Ron paid all his expenses. He said Ron probably paid out $7,000 in that short amount of time. And they only made six feet of progress. So 
he was in it 100%. The digging a second tunnel is another sign that he was telling the truth. He spent a lot of money for the second tunnel that was more direct. If you're a fraud, all you need is one tunnel. Okay? One tunnel and a good story. Yeah, and then yep. you could say, hey, you know, if I'm the real fraud, uh, come on down through this tunnel. I'll let you look in this cave and you can see my Ark of the Covenant that I made. And you just pay me $5,000 and you can do that. But no, Ron wouldn't let people look into the cave. You know, did the high priest let people look into the most holy place? No. No, and in fact, what, what would happen if they did? Uh, they, they would, would die. die. Now, tell us yes. a little bit about how that correlation, we don't want to get into too much detail, but I want to share that because we're at this point and we want to talk about this. So, it's interesting that you mentioned that Ron was like a type of high priest that went yes. into the holy place because others tried to go in there. What happened? Yes. Uh, around 1995, there is a tunnel leading from Zedekiah's cave up to where the cave is north of the city wall. And they made it approximately 75 feet up this tunnel. It was six men, six Kohathites, dressed in Levitical garb. They so they were serious. They, they, were they serious. must have believed They were going to... after the ark, yes. Okay. Yes. They made it 75 feet up this tunnel, and God struck them all dead. Wow. And Ron was in town at the time, and they contacted Ron in Jerusalem. We come down here to Zedekiah's cave. And so he went down there, and they said, six men went up this tunnel, and we can't hear from them now. And so he went up the tunnel with a rescue basket, and rolled the men into the basket, and they were pulled out one by one. So the Israeli authorities know this is real, but they don't know what to do. You know, at this point, it's a waiting game for them, and it is for us too. It's not for mm -hmm. us. God has a timing for this, and it's not for us to force the issue, you know, to try to bring it out. So the Israeli authority, they know it's there. I find that very interesting because, you know, Ron's first trip down there, uh, to find the Ark of the Covenant and to do, do all of these uh, discoveries. This was before the Indiana Jones movies came out. Yes. Um, it's almost as if he was the inspiration well, for the it's, movies. It's, <laughs> I think, you know, in 78, Ron made this statement and Satan heard it too. And Satan said to Steve Spielberg, let's make a movie about the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. That's what I think. Okay, so the, the bogus story comes out when the real story is coming out. But uh, Ron was a, a totally genuine man. I had an email from someone there in Middle Tennessee. She said Ron was her anethodist when she was giving birth and that Ron had prayed with her um, beforehand. And when her baby was born, it was stillborn. I've read the story. It's on your yes, website. Yes, yeah. And she started screaming. She was so distraught. And then she looked for Ron in the room, and over in the corner was Ron kneeling down, praying for mm. that baby. And then a light appeared in the center of the room. Now, by the, by the account that's on the website, it, it sounds like the other doctors didn't see that light, but they knew something was the strange. The doctor did something tell her later, on. the doctor did tell her later that they understood God was in the room. Huh. And that baby started crying. Mm. That light came on to say, this is not an accident. God is here, and I'm about to do something. And so God listened to Ron. There's not many people that can pray and someone comes back to life. Ron had a genuine connection with God, and he gave God all the credit, though, of course. This is something you know, I, I found out through someone contacting me. It's nothing he mm. ever told anybody. Really? So he didn't relate this? He didn't well, say anything? Right, not that I know of. This is something totally new. So the man was genuine. He had an incredible connection with God. And I view him as the most important person I've ever met in my life, that's ever lived during my lifetime, is Ron, Ron Wyatt. So now, what, now we're going to get into a little bit later in the second half of the program tonight, uh, Michael's encounter with, with uh, Ron and uh, just how he found the discoveries and what got him interested as well. Sure. But uh, yeah, I, I just find that this every where you turn about Ron Wyatt, other than what is seen in the media, and the media, strangely enough, has just sort of written him off and they don't yes. talk about him. They're, yes. they're scoff. Yeah. But he's a genuine guy. Right. You know, Satan controls the media. You can't expect the evening news to announce 
Ron White has found all these wonderful things. Isn't this exciting? They're never going to say that. No, there's there's two obscure stories from CNN and uh, yeah. CBS Morning News or something like that from back yeah. in the 80s and early 90s. And I can just imagine the the guests on the show smirking as they're listening to this going, yeah, okay, well, coming up next, you yeah. know. Yeah, and even the majority of archaeologists, you know, a majority of them don't even believe the exodus from Egypt ever happened. And yet we're to look to them as being the authority on whether these things are real or not. Thankfully, you know, the, uh, the, the new documentary that has come out, The uh, Patterns of Evidence, has yeah. all but quashed those yes. uh, reservations because right. it's real. I mean, you look at that and it's, it's pretty undeniable. Yes, and they're working on their second film, which will cover the Red Sea Crossing site that Ron found and the Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia that he found. All of these exciting so. things that we're going to be talking about in this series. For more than 20 years, Ron Wyatt spent his life and his life savings on researching and finding the real Mount Sinai, Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's Ark, and the Ark of the Covenant. Discover the amazing truth of Ron Wyatt's discoveries in a special series from A Rude Awakening International, A.D. Archaeology Discovered. Special guest Kevin Fisher walks you through every discovery in detail, including his personal verification that the sites Ron White found are real. The, you can see the four major discoveries, the Noah's Ark, Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, Solomon Gomorrah, those are visible things. Right now, you can order this fascinating series on DVD and Blu-ray. You'll get all four episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. It's not for us. God has a timing for this. It's not for us to force the issue, you know, to try to bring it out. So, Israeli authority, they know it's there. Order AD, Archaeology Discovered. Order online or by phone. And welcome back to the program. Thank you for supporting what we do here on Shabbat Night Live. Now, we are back with our guest, Kevin Fisher, and we are going to talk about some very exciting things. Before, we were talking about Ron Wyatt and what you are doing for Ron now through arcdiscovery.com. You are the president of Arc Discovery International, and this was a work that started a year after that Ron had died. And so uh, this was a passion of yours that you never got to work with him while he was living, but uh, you have decided to carry his torch. Sure. I'm just trying to promote, you know, what God has brought out, and we've seen that they're authentic. And so it's, it's very exciting information. Indeed. And Michael had met uh, Ron Wyatt. This is how Michael got interested in the Red Sea Crossing, Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah. all the classic teachings that Michael Rood has done came from visiting with Ron Wyatt. And he, like you, had, had mm -hmm. visited with Ron Wyatt in mm -hmm. person, found him to be a very humble, genuine individual sure. that, that it was impossible to doubt that the things that he discovered were real, and that's why Michael is so passionate about it as well. And he met uh, he met Ron through going to a talk by Henry Groover, and Henry mm -hmm. Groover encouraged Michael uh, to to go and visit Ron, yeah, and see that he was real. And sure. so I'm glad that you're here because uh, Michael would be just tickled that you're showing all these things here. Michael has his own collection of brimstone. Yeah, I know and, he's been there a lot. Yeah, and that's yeah. what we're going to get into now. We're going to get into the nitty gritty here. We're going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, and then we're going to talk about something else yet in this next segment of the program. So uh, take it away, Kevin. What can okay. you tell us about Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, first of all, a lot of people think all the cities are under the south end of the Dead Sea that you cannot see them. Okay. But we're told by Josephus the traces or shadows of the five cities are still to be seen. This was in the first century, and the water level has not risen since that time. Hmm. We should be able to see them also. And so when Ron Wyatt in 1989 was driving along the Dead Sea, the one road along the Dead Sea there that goes through Israel, he saw these light color formations. In the background, you can see Masada in this okay. image. Uh, the, the see Masada is much darker. In the foreground, you see the soil is much darker. Mm. But in the middle bottom there, going horizontally, you see the ashen remains of Gomorrah. So that's right on this. I mean, we can see it in this photograph. Yes, yes. They didn't disappear, as right. some people say, into the, into the yeah. sea. And these are ashen formations. These are not just uh, natural sedimentary rock and so forth. And so this is an image up to the north this is of Adma near Jericho. Okay. And again, you see the light color ash. Um, and in it's, it's very distinct, isn't it? It's, it's, yes, it it's stands different. out, right, right. And then it is a soft material compared to what you would see normally in some type of soil. And then here is inside the, one of the cities. This is probably in Gomorrah. 
Um, in the distance, you can see some right angles, hmm. uh, a sign of, again, man-made construction. Now, I lived in a, a, in a province in Canada called Alberta for some time when I was uh, younger, and okay. uh, there was an area there called Drumheller. And it had uh, rock formations called hoodoos, is what they called them there. Okay. And it was where they found a lot of dinosaur bones from erosion and things like that. And people might argue that, well, those are just hoodoos, or those are like what we see in Arizona. But at closer inspection, that is not what we're seeing here. It's Even a, I can see that. Yeah, it's a combination of, of burned limestone and, and brimstone or sulfur uh, is what it is. Uh, the ash has been analyzed and so forth. And here's a nice image here of a nice 90 degree angle with a straight edge, uh, again sign of some type of man-made construction in the ashes there. Right, because even though we see, like we talked about Arizona, where you have these rock formations that have been uh, dug out by wind erosion uh, mm -hmm. years and years, they're usually rounded things. They're not going to be square, yeah. like you have arcs right. and uh, things of that nature, but not, yes. nothing like this. Yes, these stand out. And then here's an image I shot of, it looks like an arched entrance into the remains there. Um, you have to be very careful when inspecting these sites. I've seen a lot of people, last time I was there, I saw more and more evidence, I was back there in November, more and more evidence that, that uh, people are inspecting these sites. People were stopping and getting out when we were there to inspect them. But uh, there was a tour group that went out there and they found a hole on top of the remains here and the people started gathering around it and it fell through. Ooh. And five people died. Really? It's hard to breathe in ash. Ah. And uh, so you have to be very careful trying to go into the remains. So now there's another risk of this whole uh, discovery here that although we are finding more information about this area, I mean, if there are deaths happening there, it could be quite plausible that the, the Israeli government could say, that's enough, we're closing this off. Yes, they could at some point, uh, but the tour groups are not going out there anymore. Mm. Of course, the tour leaders don't want to be held accountable for something happening Oh, so like this that. did not happen in most recently in November? Not November. recently, no. Okay. But sometime okay. in the past. So you have to be careful when going out there. So here's another image we could see on one of the streets. In the mm. distance, you can see some beautiful 90 degree angles jutting out from the formations. That definitely looks like a yeah. building of some type. Yes, right. Um, more evidence of man-made construction. And then here's a little closer shot of it. Really impressive, jutting out. So now the, the walls are there, but now we see a lot of uh, sediment around yes. the walls and water erosion over the years. Well, yeah. What is all that sediment there? That's more the ash that's just run down, the, the, the loose part of it that has worked its way down. Uh, there is some rain out here, not a whole lot. It does get a lot of wind erosion, as you spoke of, uh, in this area. So uh, most of the cities, you know, they're in poor condition, but, you know, they're 3,500 years old. Very, you know, very old remains, and it's rather soft material, so you can't expect them, you know, to look perfect at this point. Now, Paul knew about these. He, he yes. knew about these cities, he spoke of them. Uh, yes. Now, do you, is there any evidence to suggest or do you know that people have always known that these cities are there and it's just in recent times that we've dismissed it? Well, you know, Josephus did say that he saw the brimstone. Josephus said he saw Lot's wife's pillar. Um, and then he said traces or shadows of the cities are still to be seen. So it was documented in the first century, you know, that they were there. And you know, Paul does say that they're a sign or example unto us, unto the ends of the world. And that example there is a visible example. And that's what we're seeing here, are signs of God's past judgment that we need to heed. Because uh, this is gonna happen again in the future when the lake of fire, fire and brimstone, you know, it falls down. So, and then here's another shot of some of the remains. Uh, again, 90 degree angles coming out from the formations. And then here's a shot. This is like a 90 degree turn here. It's basically a square structure sticking out from the ash. It continues around the other side. So you have multiple 90 degree angles on this building. Are there any uh, assumptions as to what some of these things may have been? I know that Michael in his, uh, his series on Sodom and Gomorrah mentions one area that looks like it would have been a temple. Yes, there are some that are singular structures that do appear to be uh, a large square looking building. So yeah, 
I think we may have an image of one here in the slides. Now here is a swirling effect of thermal ionization, they call it, where there's a swirling effect where the electrons repel and attract, and these remains were swirling in the ex extreme heat, you know, 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and so you see the swirling effect in a lot of the remains there. And this is documented by those who know about these uh, these scientific phenomena here that happen. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now here it says the aster today is composed of calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate, which are byproducts of the limestone and sulfur burning. So the ash there is made of the correct composition of the buildings, the limestone burning up, hmm. and the brimstone being there, the sulfur. Uh, you know, at the days of Elijah. When his altar was consumed, God sent down fire and it consumed the stone altar. So we should expect the buildings there to also be consumed and turned to ash. God's fire is a consuming fire. And that's what he did that day. He consumed all the buildings. So the chemistry doesn't lie. Right. This proves that there was a building here. These are not just geological formations. Yes, it's a testament yeah, to what happened there. And here's a couple of ziggurats on a raised formation that I saw. They're side by side. They're made of a wider material, like a ziggurat. And uh, here's a close-up of the side of one of them. Hmm. It looks like it's almost running down uh, the ash there. And... You know, it's strange how uh, I've seen in some natural history museums where uh, different cultures uh, to embalm their dead, they would take them to a dry, high place like the top of a mountain where the bodies would essentially dry out and turn to a leather-like substance. And that's kind of what we have here is it's preservation through a very dry climate. So that yes. God has preserved this as a warning, like you had said, um, so that no one can argue that these are the, the sites. Yes, they're, they are well enough preserved where we can see the, the formation, we can see the brimstone, uh, and we'll see later here an uh, image of cremated bone. Ah. So people were consumed in these ashes. Uh -huh. Say so, on. And the, yeah. So in Genesis 19:24, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So we should expect to see brimstone there. And on the side of that former formation that we saw just a minute ago, um, I saw some brimstone embedded in the side of it there. It was in a hardened shell. This mm -hmm. brimstone, when it burns, the outer part of it turns to a liquid, and when it cools down, it has a hardened shell. And so in this graphic here, I'm using a knife to open it up, and inside you can see the unconsumed sulfur inside of it. Okay. Yeah. And then here is an image of something that appears to have melted. It's pulled down in the bottom, and the upper part of it here has got uh, holes in it, like it's bubbling, extreme heat. Mm -hmm. I thought this was very interesting here. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, almost like a lava rock. Yes, right. And then here is an image of, this could have been a temple. Uh, on the left, it's in the graphic behind us here. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the left, we see some type of singular ziggurat. And on the right, we see a tower. Uh, this is a popular location. There's actually dinner parties that happen right out <laughs> here. Parties. It's like the locals, locals recognize you know, this formation is unique. And yeah, I've been there twice, and they were holding you know, nighttime parties there with elaborate lights set up and a sound stage. And, so come have a party in <laughs> yeah, hell. A party, right, with all these people. <laughs> Poor people died. So this is, now obviously this struck you as something significant because you went to the expense of putting it on canvas. Yeah. So what else holds special significance for this, uh, this site? Or is it just an interesting? Well, it's very unique. You know, it looks like a man-made structure here. You have the ziggurat and you have the tower. So this is a very impressive uh, picture right here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get this photo. But uh, here is a picture, again, of the ziggurat standing uh, all alone there. And then next, this is very impressive. These are windows. You see a square window hmm. is going horizontally across here. Um, very striking to see this in the sides of the formations. Even if someone could argue that these are not walls, what in the world are square yes. holes right. doing in the side of right. them? Right, these are all squares, every one of them there going across horizontally 
And here's a little closer shot. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's stunning uh, to see this. You don't see that, you know, in nature, something like this. Very impressive. And this, again, this is in ash. And even afterward, why would people come to this site and carve things on the side? Yeah. That, that doesn't make sense and this either. is high up. This is not down low. This is up high. Mm. It's hard to get to. Now, on the edge of most of the cities were a sphinx shape. Hmm. And here we see a sphinx at the edge of Gomorrah. Um, perhaps it was designed to protect the city, but it did a poor job that day, I think. <laughs> now, if you saw um, that at just one location, you might say, well, like Golgotha, the place of the skull where Christ was crucified, there is a natural rock formation there that looks like a face. One could argue this, but there's similar uh, sphinxes I've at each heard, one of the cities. Yeah, I've heard that they're in each of the cities, yes. Um, now here's another, I'm standing by it here to get a size perspective, and you can see the nice sphinx uh, design to it. Of course, after 3,500 years, it has eroded away, but you can still see some type of design here. Mm. So, and next, our friend uh, Jason was climbing up the remains, trying to get to a large chunk of brimstone in the side of the remains. When you see a large chunk, it's nice to try to go after it. And he was able to climb up there and retrieve this large piece of brimstone. And what he's walking in there, you could see it was it was not sand, it, it was ash. Yes. Something had burned there. Loose material, right. And then here's another image of the brimstone um, that I found, it has like a burned ring around it. In the center of the cluster there, on the center right, is some unconsumed sulfur. Mm, okay. So again, the burn ring, and inside you have the, the sulfur. Now we have a box here in front of us that we'll be going through at some point, I'm assuming. Yes. Uh, and these, they, we'll be able to show you at home what we are looking at here because the, all of these things that, that Kevin is talking about, we're gonna see up close and personal. Yes. So stay tuned for that, it's coming up. Yeah, and so here is a piece of brimstone inside a hardened shell. Again, when the brimstone's on fire, the outside of it is liquid. When it cools down, it turns into a hardened crystals. Hmm. And that's what we have there, are some hardened crystals around that. Now how hard is it to open? I, you had your knife it's, in there. It's very, very stiff, it's very hardened. And so here's a piece without the hardened shell on the outside of it, there was some underneath it, but uh, that's another piece of brimstone. Now that's the piece that is very pure sulfur that is found nowhere else on Earth, correct? That's right, this sulfur is 95% pure sulfur. It's a monoclinic form of sulfur. Most sulfur you find naturally is the rhombic type that uh, it's a more yellow color, but it's only 50% sulfur. So there's a big difference. So God rained down a unique type of sulfur to do this work. Hmm. And so he left behind a marker for us to see that, you know, these sites are real. So in one of our trips here, there's this large cluster here on this um, large rock over here, or actually a piece of ash, and I'll show you a close-up of it. Here's the top of it. Now, what we're seeing on top of this, all of this on top of it are the hardened crystals. So there were hundreds of pieces of brimstone underneath this burning. It turned into a big pool of liquid. Hmm. And when that big pool of liquid, is about six feet long or so, when that pool of liquid cooled down, it left these crystals on top of it. On top there, the upper part of the photo, are the crystals. In the center across here horizontally is the unconsumed sulfur or brimstone. That, so, that white yes, section there. that white section, yeah. So, very, very impressive find. Again, on top of the crystals, you see the brimstone in the center going horizontally. Um, very impressive find. Here's another image of it. You see the brimstone sticking out, mm -hmm. the crystals on top. I mean, you're not gonna find this anywhere else on Earth. You know, this is totally unique. So does the government of Israel allow people to go in and, and take sulfur, they, they don't do, mind? They do, you know, the area is so large, uh, you know, there's no limit as far as I know. <laughs> Let the whole Earth well, be warned, take yourself yes. home a piece of brimstone yes. and don't do this. <laughs> right. 
And so here is a close-up of some of the layers. Sometimes there's layering effects. In the background was the Sphinx shape we saw earlier. Ah, okay. Yeah, when the Dead Sea in the background. And so here's a close-up of another piece of brimstone in the formations that we opened up. You can see the unconsumed sulfur inside. How many times have you been to this particular site? Well, I made three trips over there to Israel, but I went to the site, you know, numerous times while there, um, many hours. It's very impressive. Originally, I was not real impressed with the Sodom and Gomorrah stuff, but once you go out there yourself and start seeing this firsthand, it's very impressive uh, to see it come to life in front of you. Now, some of these are in vertical, they're basically shot into the sides of, of the uh, of the walls. Are they? Some of them are found in vertical. Um, yeah, they're in you know various wall. various uh, locations, and some people have. Well, I think Ron Wyatt thought they may have originally been about a foot in diameter, hmm. originally, and then burned down to the smaller size. And here's a 90 degree angle, sort of like a window in the side of the formations. Pretty impressive. Here is another sphinx. Now this one's in Gomorrah again. In the background is a ziggurat shape. So sphinx, ziggurat. In Egypt you have a sphinx pyramid you know, near each other. But this is on a raised area, sort of like a high place. Here's a close-up of the sphinx from another angle. Oh, there you can see it. You can see the, it's, the shape. Yes. It's definitely something man-made there. Right, and this is again an elevated area for worship. There it is again, and the background mm. is Masada. Um, and this is about 40 feet long. This is a large sphinx shape here. Very impressive. And then near it, we saw in the distance, was this ziggurat. And those, you know, it should be just outcroppings like that. Uh, again, more evidence that there's something different here. This was specifically made here. This was intentional. And then here, this was taken down at the south end of the Dead Sea is Zoar. Zoar was later consumed. And it has kind of a square. If you see the light ash there, mm -hmm. there's, it's a, this has kind of a square shape, the white ash there. So, so like today, we, the, the downtown core areas of most cities are grids, mm -hmm. because that's where they start, and then yeah. the sprawl and begins. And they branch out, yeah. yeah. Lose okay. its square shape, yeah. Here's another image in Zoar of a square image in the background. So this is drone footage. What, uh, what are we seeing here? Yes, so here we're looking down on the formations and then I'm panning up. Oh and, wow, look at that. Yeah, and you can see across the city there. Now this city, which city is this one? This would be considered Gomorrah. Okay. The Bible gives the cities an order, creating the Canaanite border and this would be the third city that's mentioned, starting from the south and going up. The so dead. this is much larger than Zoar. This is yes, huge. right. This is huge. Sodom and Gomorrah were the two largest. That's why a lot of times you hear them say Sodom and Gomorrah, and they don't mention the other cities because they were smaller. But in the distance is the Dead Sea. And this is all city, or some of this the, the hillside surrounding? This would be all city here that we're looking at. Previously, we did see Masada in the background, but at this point, this would be all city. How tall are the walls here? I mean, if, at a estimation, what were the, uh, yeah. the heights of these buildings? About 30 feet, a lot of them. It's quite large. And what are we, what are we seeing there? The, just a, is that a street or where the river runs? A lot of these would be streets. And of course, there has been some erosion since the time. And there's the base of Masada in the background. Hmm. Now some of these, like on the right-hand side there, you can see that one little uh, area on the second level, as it were. Yes. That is very right angle. Right, that right. Looks far different. right here, yes, uh-huh. Yeah, the, you can't deny that that was something man-made. Yes. And what are we seeing here as we zoom in over, over this area? These are more of the remains here. You can see, again, the flat wall on the right here, right center. It's almost buried. And that's all brims that's all the crystallization on top and brimstone underneath, I would assume. Some of it would be. Most of this is just loose ash. Oh, okay. Yeah. But again, ash, not dirt. Right, right. This this did happen here. Yes. 
So why do you think it is that uh, archaeologists still dispute that these are the cities and they claim that they were swallowed up into the Dead Sea? I don't, I don't understand. I mean, the, the evidence here is so clear. It's very interesting. Wow, look at that. So you've gone out here several times. Are you bring people with you or do you explore on your own? Well, it's usually just friends you know, I bring out there to take a look. Okay. But uh, very exciting to see. Now, it's are, also sad. I mean, you got to yeah. realize that there were, you know, perhaps 200,000 people you know, died here in Gomorrah. Now, you had uh, mentioned a few minutes ago about bones, human yes. bones. Yes. Do we want to get into that before we run out of time? We here? can. We can okay. show what we have here in the display box that I brought. But um, in the top left, you can see the naturally occurring rhombic sulfur. And that's found elsewhere in the and world. Elsewhere, yes. It's just 50% okay. sulfur. On the left side, we see two pieces of brimstone, one in the hardened shell. The other one, the bottom left, is out of the shell. And then in the top center, we see something that looks melted, a melted substance. In the bottom center, we can see cremated bone. Dr. Leonard Moeller, in his book, The Exodus Case, he has an image of a pelvic bone and vertebrae that he found out there. This is the same Leonard Moeller who was on uh, Michael Rood's yes. Red Sea Crossing. That's he was right. the captain of the boat, as it were. Yes. And then on the right side here, we have some of the consumed brimstone where it turned into a liquid. And when it cooled down, it crystallized. So these are crystals here on the right side. Of and our that's what we saw on that six-foot pool yes. that you were showing earlier. Right, the crystals. That That's is right. just eerie, especially the bone. Yes. That makes it, you know, why would there be people's bones out there? Why would they be cremated? What's with the ash all around the yes, area? Sir. It all adds up, doesn't it? It does. It, it, it's just too obvious. Well, this has been fascinating, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got way more to talk about here. We're going to talk about Kadesh Barnea. We're going to talk about the Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, the Ark of the Covenant, and our final episode is going to be Noah's Ark. So... Stay tuned to see the rest of the series. Thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live, and we will see you next time with our guest, Kevin Fisher from...